Get the cream, precious metals or the crypto things Your bars are light like the one that's on a Smith machine But my Mac's swell and I ain't speaking about the pretty Amari Miller just made a real big mistake A big mistake Not only did she shoot a shot At somebody who's a much bigger star than she is Which is always an L When you're in the WWE locker room But she took a shot at Sasha Banks which is a head scratcher. And the third thing is she went after Sasha Banks' race, which is like, oh, come on, man. This was, I'm not even going to hold you up. There's no reason to talk about this for 10 minutes. This is career suicide for Mari Miller. I don't see how she can get out of this one. You know, she doesn't have enough clout to get out of this one unscathed. Now, it is a different day in WWE. So maybe, maybe it will, maybe it'll last a little bit longer than people think. But for those of you who are a little left behind, you're like, okay, what are you talking about? All right. So Amari Miller <laughs> made a tweet, which of course, Twitter is, uh, it's certainly a thing. She decided she was going to, uh, go on the Twitter machine, say words. And the words that she said, were highly unintelligent, but they were her words and they were her thoughts. So on August the 10th, this is what Amari Miller tweeted out. Shout out to Ember Moon being the first and only African-American NXT Women's Champion. NXT goal or next goal. Let's make it two. Heart and uh, fingers crossed and a heart with the hands. She was then promptly reminded that Sasha Banks is black. Promptly reminded by Sa that Sasha Banks is black. She responded, quote, no thanks. Sasha is German and black. I said African-American and put a smiley face. She then doubled down by saying, for everyone on Twitter, fully black NXT champion Ember Moon, I'm aware of what I posted. Sasha is great and legendary for sure. Let's never forget. So she denied that Sasha Banks was black on the Twitter machine. So, you know, she about to get roasted. She then deleted her Twitter for a short period of time before coming back and apologizing. For those of you who don't know, Sasha Banks' uh, mama is white, um, German to be exact. And, uh, this was a big mistake. So I feel in, that I have to talk about it. Spend some time talking about it. Because race relations in the United States is different than race relations pretty much everywhere else. Because in the U.S. we had that one drop rule. Now, I know that in places like Brazil where there's far more mixed people. Mixed, being in quotations. Than pretty much anywhere else. They kind of have that black, white, colored sort of thing where they have a large mixed race population. In the United States, there's, there's still not that many mixed race people, even though there are, there should be. Most people probably would be considered mixed race, both blacks and whites, especially if you've been here. If you are one of those, what Tariq Nasheed would call foundational black Americans, then nine, nine times out of 10, you're probably mixed anyway. You know, um, I, I'm under no, uh, certainty that my, my parentage goes back to the deepest, darkest part of Africa. I'm pretty sure my grandmother probably had some, some white grandfather or something like that. I mean, that's just kind of how it is in the United States. And it's been like that pretty much anywhere, especially if, you know, when, when people got boats and they can go from place to place, almost everybody is mixed in some, to some degree. Unless you literally came from Africa. So if you're from some kind of island, you're probably mixed, you know, um, or something like that. So this idea um, of blackness, it is what they call a social construct. Because when you talk to like when I grew up, I grew up with Africans, talking to Africans and people from islands. They didn't have the same formulation of race that that Americans have because they're different. And what I mean by that is everybody looks the same. You know, I met a Nigerian guy. His, his name was John, but his, he tried, he tried to get away from us 
to tell us what his real name was. I really wanted to find out what his real name was. And it was something like Amygdala or something like that. It was a crazy name. But he, thank God he was a Christian, so he changed the name to John. And that's what he, we called him. We called him John. And he had no conception of American visions of race relations. When I worked with a, a Nigerian, he would always call black people, you people. And we used to fucking hate that guy. Cause he'd be like, what the hell do you mean? You people. But we had to, I mean, that's back when I was a kid though. I was like 20, 22 or something like that. I didn't understand. I got offended, you know, cause I was, you know, pan African waving the flag. Like, Hey, we all supposed to be, we supposed to be brothers. I didn't understand. This dude is from Africa. Everybody looks like him. He was talking about in certain African sets, and you get this a little bit with the, with the with the West Indians and the Jamaicans and stuff like that. People who have ethnic roots, you know, they don't really look at things racially because everyone looks like them already. So they break that society down to tribe, clan, family, etc. So when I was talking to the African guys, like um like John, for instance. He would never say that he was black. He would always say what tribe he was from. That was that was his thing. That was his main focus. Because while we're all black, he came from a place that was black. And he treated almost all white people the same. And he treated black Americans the same as white Americans. And it was it was a bizarre situation because he wasn't a disrespectful guy. But he understood that there was a difference between him as an immigrant and us as people who were born here. And he recognized that difference and he wanted to respect it without being disrespectful. He knew that most of us didn't know what Joloff Rice was. You know, most of us didn't know that. We didn't eat the same stuff. You know, we didn't grow up under the same situations. You know, so over time, we started seeing that treating the sheet stuff pop up. We start seeing about foundational black Americans and it's an anti-immigrant um, black thing. So I grew up with some negative uh, conceptions of Africans who didn't see us as being one people or and all that kind of stuff. But I also grew up with some positive ones. I had a Kenyan professor in college who taught me Swahili. He had been in the United States long enough to sort of have that kind of washed away. He still had that cultural aspect that he's Kenyan. He's from this particular tribe. He had, he came over here as an adult. So you can't, you know, get all of that stuff out of him, but he'd been here since the seventies. And when I met him, it was like 20, 2009, maybe. So he had been there for 40 years. He doesn't have the same exact conceptions as John would have. And John is fresh off the plane. Notice I didn't say boot. I said plane. You know, they do have planes in Nigeria, for Christ's sake. Then I've met Jamaicans, and they're kind of the same way. You know, Jamaicans tend to have a, a more unifying message anyway. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like almost every Jamaican I've met is some version of Bob Marley. You know, it's like, you know, with the exception of like, you know, like maybe one or two. Most of them are like, you know, Pan-African, you know, we're all one people sort of thing. You don't really get that from the Trinidadians or the Dominicans, for instance. They have a very strong, I'm Dominican, not necessarily black. And Puerto Rican is kind of the same thing. Um, the, the odd thing about it is, is that in America, where we have this, the, the race relations, we've been going by the one drop rule. And the one drop rule is if you have any black ancestry at all, then you're black, period. Even if you don't look black. You might have black features. So this is kind of where we started getting jokes about like Ronda Rousey. You know, Ronda Rousey has like a black grandparent or something like that. So now we're like, okay, Ronda Rousey is black. Of course, Ronda Rousey, you know, but in, in the, the, what, what they call it, the social construction of race, Ronda Rousey is not black. She's white. But even though she might have like a black grandparent, you know, and that's where we get like the ridiculousness of it because we're like, okay, the only way for us to know who is black quote unquote is to look at them. But if we look at somebody and we're wrong and somebody has like a black grandparent, uh, you know, or something like that, 
then we have to deny that they're black, you know, for the benefit of we just want this person to be white or whatever the case may be, or they don't look black. They don't look like us, but it might also be that somebody is black, but they didn't quote grow up black. And this is another social construction idea that there's a certain concept that comes with being black in the United States growing up in the projects or growing up in the hood, listening to rap music. You know, I remember, again, let me use my own life as an, an example. I remember the first time I ever met a middle-class black dude. I'm talking, listen to rock music, wore cut off gloves. He was an absolute nerd. He loved anime. He wore shredded pants. He was the first dude I ever, you know, with good diction I ever met. You know, the first dude I ever heard that didn't say stuff like, I ain't doing that, you know. And, you know, something like that. He had decent, you know, diction, decent English. We all grew up, you know, with slang and we were butchering the slang, to be quite honest. I could read fine and could write perfectly. But when it comes to speaking, you know, it was like hood rat English. <laughs> you know, this is well, this was like when I was like, you know, a kid. And we used to just deny that he was black. You know, he ain't really black. He ain't really like us. He ain't grow up in the hood. You know, and he don't know nothing about the streets. He don't know nothing about the cops pulling you over for no reason. He don't know nothing. Like, you ain't you ain't heard a new Tupac album? Oh, you don't listen to Nas? You never heard? You know, of course, he heard of 50 Cent eventually. <laughs> but you talk about, like, it's a different headspace. You know, me and a black dude who listens to like Metallica and grew up with that stuff, grew up with like Guns N' Roses and stuff like that. He didn't grow up on rap music because he had like a white parent who introduced him to a lot of different things. He didn't watch the, the same TV shows that we had watched. So to us, he wasn't black or wasn't black enough. And that brings us back to this conversation because the Sasha Banks thing immediately brought me to the rock because there are so many people who have, and, and this was a similar thing when Lashley won the title, you know, cause they were like, when Lashley became WWE champion, I did see people in the corners of the internet. Finally, a black man who was born in the United States is the WWE champion. And I was like, come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, like, bruh. What about The Rock? Well, The Rock identifies as Samoan. I'm like, oh, fuck. What about Kofi? Oh, Kofi was born in Africa. I'm like, oh, fuck. Are you serious? We keep changing the definition of who black is, what black is. Who is black? Who is the first black WWE champion? We keep changing the definition. We keep flip-flopping, and, and we don't know who that is. Whenever there's a, an achievement of some kind, there's always going to be somebody in the background to say that it, it's not real because this guy doesn't count. This guy doesn't count for this reason. You have to account for the Rock's upgrow, upbringing. The Rock grew up in Hawaii with his mostly Samoan family. So, yes, he's going to have that more flavor towards the Samoans. He didn't grow up with his black family. Not really. Okay doesn't change the fact that he's still black. His daddy is black. And then I got the whole uh, Rocky Johnson was Canadian thing. And I was like, okay, you know what? <laughs> what the fuck? You just can't win. The dude is black. You know, but he's Canadian, so that doesn't count. All right. Of course, the World Heavyweight Championship, Booker T, black is a thousand midnights. Him and Mark Henry, they don't count because it wasn't the right belt. So then you get Kofi and now Kofi's the champion and people are like, yay, Kofi won the title. It was excellent. It was great. But Kofi was born in, in Ghana, West Africa. Oh no, he's an immigrant. I'm like, uh, not good enough. And then, uh, Lashley won the title and everybody was so excited. And it was like, finally a black man born in the United States. He's like, the ch I think he's like, you know, related to immigrants. I think he's from Panama. His, uh, his family, that's where his family originally is from. And I just kind of had this conception. I was just kind of like, this makes no sense that we keep going through this. 
So for everybody who think like this is like some wild shit that just popped up for Sasha Banks, it's like it's not. We get this crap all all the fucking time, man. You know, people deal deal with this stuff literally all the time. You know, you get into it, you meet people in real life, and either they de- they deny being black because they're from some kind of island or or something like that, or we don't we don't identify that way, or you you're trying to recruit people who don't want to be recruited. That would be like the big Dominican population. <laughs> you don't want to be recruited. A lot of Africans don't want to be recruited to being in the black Pan African population. And that's why you kind of kind of have to care about individuals, you know, because some individuals do come to the United States and they have that unique experience. They get called black by white people and they're like, wait a minute, I'm black. There was a, uh, there was another Nigerian lady. Um, she's a, actually a famous feminist. She wrote an article about how she wasn't black until she got to the United States. You know, she probably wasn't a feminist either until she got here, but she focused on the race part. I forget what her name is. It's like in, in Gichi and in Dochi or something like that. Something. But when you look at what's going on with Amari Miller and Sasha Banks, you have to understand that there are people who still have that mentality. If you're mixed, if you're an immigrant, you're not black. Now, Amari Miller did apologize. She did apologize. Let's talk about the apology real quick. So this is what she posted when she returned to Twitter a few hours later. I didn't mean bad intentions with what I had said, but I do want to apologize. I meant something super well, and it came across horribly. I want to sincerely apologize to everyone. I also have to understand that posting on a social media platform can sound one way to me. As I'm typing and can come across different, but that's lessons learned for sure. People make mistakes and people grow. And that is exactly what the experience was for me. Now we're going to get into the commentary around this, which of course means she's getting flamed, but there's also a healthy number of people who are going to actually support what she said. So this is a subject with much nuance because we have so many, and, and to be quite honest, to go back to the, to the social political aspects of this for a little while, we, we're going to get to the flame war, but let's talk about this a little bit more. I talked a couple of times in this joint already about the Tariq Nasheed foundational black Americans thing, which is absolutely laughable that anybody will follow hus- you know, race hustler and pimp Tariq Nasheed. I mean, the dude is whatever it takes to make money today. When, when hip hop was a thing, he wanted to be a rapper. You know, when funk bands were kind of trying to make a comeback, he wanted to be in a funk band. He wanted to be a pimp when pimps were popular. He wanted to be a, a black documentarian, a black historian when that was popular. Then d- during the, uh, the, the breakup of the, of the black voting block during the Trump administration, he wanted to create the foundational black Americans an anti-immigrant you know, pro-black, you had to have been born here with grandparents who were born here and descendants of slaves, you know. It's getting more and more ridiculous with the guy, you know. And uh, that sort of mentality, it's been going on for a little while now, to be quite honest. And there was a book, it was written by a guy named Eugene Robinson, it's called Disintegration. And it was about, basically... He kind of called this. I think it was written in 2011. So before, you know, the Trump era, it was like right, right after Obama. is they started to see this fracturing in black America where Obama was so many things to so many different people that he was a perfect prism. He was the son of immigrants. Well, his father was an immigrant, rather. He was black, but he wasn't born in the hood or wasn't raised in the hood. He was raised by his white parents. So anytime somebody had a problem with Obama, it was either one, he was a man because you had the feminist angle to it. Two, he was raised by white people, which was, you know, when I first started seeing critiques of Obama, that was the first thing I heard is that, you know, he had a white mama and that was the problem why he wouldn't, you know, help the black families because he had white, he grew up with his white people, you know, he grew up in Hawaii and Indonesia. He wasn't really black. 
<laughs> Again, you see how we go through this, right? And that became the way that everybody looked at Obama. He tried, he was everything to everybody, but in doing so, you also became the negative, you know, that sparked the birth of a movement. Is he really even American? That whole thing. So we started, we, we, we've doing, we've been doing this for a while. We've been doing this dance for many, for many a year. You know, there has been in the sixties, there was a big push for Pan-Africanism, which actually helped, um, both sides, both the, the Af people, black people who lived in the African continent and in the islands and in America, try to bond, you know, combine themselves and, and build upon a single grand narrative, which was, we're all either victims of some type of victim of slavery. You know, if you were in Jamaica, you were probably brought there on the, on a boat by, you know, what was it? The French, the Haitians, same thing. Dominicans, same thing. You know, um, Americans in the South, same thing. Of course, Americans, black, most black people live in the South in the United States and they matriculate to other places like Detroit and Chicago and New York or whatever. And you had these people try to divvy up the black population in that way. And the Trump era really kind of saw the explosion of it. That's when you started seeing that there were a lot of black liberals, let's put it like that, who didn't like immigrants. You would see them complain on college campuses that most of the black spots, the black quota that they put together in these high end universities like Yale and Harvard, they were being filled up by Nigerians and Ghanaians and Jamaicans and people from the West Indies, Canadians, Somalians. There wasn't too many people from, you know, Kansas City, St. Louis, you know, not a lot of people from Oakland or Detroit or Baltimore going to Yale. There, it was almost always, you know, immigrants. So they started to complain. They started to whine. They started to bitch. They started saying, no, we need to have our own spots. This stuff was for us, the people who were the descendants of slaves. And that's when that became the like part of the reparations movement. When they used to say, well, who gets reparations? Does somebody who is of Jamaican descent, who came to the United States, married a white person, had a mixed baby? Do they get reparations? Oh, no, 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 no. Your, your parent was from Jamaica. You don't get reparations from the United States. Well, I guess, was there no slavery in Jamaica? You know, oh, well, no, you have to, the Jamaican government should have to pay for that. Like, well, the Jamaican government is like 90% black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but that just became like the messy situation that we created for ourselves. So the idea that there's going to be people who are going to support Amari Miller when she said that Tasha Banks ain't black, it's no surprise to me. It came as absolutely no surprise to me. I've been, I've been paying attention to this stuff for a long, long time now. And we started to see how people have, you know, picked your politics for you based off of what your birth storyline is. Where was your grandparents from? You know, where, where did they go to school? Did they have money or not? All this kind of stuff, which really has no, it is just pointless shit, you know? And sometimes the tr only true black conservatives are people who are just the children of immigrants who don't want to give up anything for, you know, <laughs> the benefit of the foundational black Americans who were here and built this society for you to be in. Everybody else is a conservative. It's like, well, that's not exactly true. That's not entirely true. Not true at all, actually. <laughs> you know? So... Let's get into this because this is, this, I've talked about this a lot longer than I thought I should have, but I decided to just make it a, a, a bigger conversation about the disintegration of the, the black population. Now that book to talk about it a little bit, I haven't read it completely, but I listened to the guy talk about it and he says that basically there are, are different black populations that are starting to prop up. There's the upperly mobile black people, the black middle class. We've had this for a long time. Uh, there was a book, another book. It was called Our Kind of People. 
I had that book for a long time. I probably read through two, th- maybe a third of it. And then I don't remember it anymore. But it was about the black middle class during an era of like reconstruction and um, stuff like that. They thought they were different than the poor black people because it was a, a class divide. And basically, Eugene Robinson is talking about that. that there's a class divide between the middle, the upper, upper class, the Jay-Z's and the Russell Simmons and Whoopi and Oprah and all them. And the average black people who are not upwardly mobile, but kind of stuck in middle class jobs or stuck in low class positions. Then you have your mixed people and you have your immigrant population. The immigrant population tends to do better than the average population, too. And the mixed population tends to do better than the average population. The average meaning the what Tariq Nasheed would call the foundational black Americans. The reason for that, we aren't quite sure. Some people would say, well, it's obviously IQ. You know, if you listen to like the Stefan Molyneux types, you would get the, uh, the, the, well, that wouldn't even be true because if, because the Stefan Molyneux types believe that the black Americans in the United States have a higher um, IQ because they mix with white people, which is probably the most racist thing that Stefan Molyneux has said that I've heard, you know, and <laughs> cause it's wrong by the way. But, um, the idea that immigrants come over and do better. Now we can argue that motivation is one of those things. It's not necessarily that, uh, immigrants are smarter than quote unquote foundational black Americans, but if they are already in better positions, by better financial position, cause they got to move from one country to another. So they are already better off. They have the money to leave their own country to come to the United States. And they're going to, you know, put their kid in a better school. The kid's going to do better. They tend to be stricter parents too, by the way. We can't talk about that part. You know, we just have to talk strictly about them being immigrants. It's like, I've met people who had immigrant parents. Again, I knew a guy who had immigrant parents. They tend to be very strict, you know, enforce things like homework, you know, you don't, you don't get that a lot. Like I didn't get that a lot as a kid that my mom made me do homework. My friends didn't get that a lot. I'm just talking about my experience. I mean, you know, you could say, well, it's not true. I, my, I was born in Chicago and yada, yada, yada. It's like, yeah, that's great. I'm talking about my experience, right? I didn't have that push to forcefully educate yourself, even though my dad was big on education. He wasn't fucking around. So I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like a, he had his boot on my neck. You know, but other parents, they were and they forced the issue and you see it in the outcomes. What happens when, you know, the old conservative talking point, you have two parents in the household, they really produce and, you know, something that their kids can value in terms of, you know, having a decent job or running a business or something like that. And if you come from another foreign country and you already have just a little bit of money, maybe if you just got just enough to get from there to here, you know, without having to, you know, jump a fence or something like that, then, you know, you typically have more motivation to go out and do more. While some of the people who were born here have developed a sense of entitlement. There's just no other way to put it, you know. We should be given stuff. We should be given reparations. We should be given better schools. We should be given better food. You know, the government should do whatever they can to make sure that we are, are you know, are, are comfortable at the bottom. That's really what the point is. Is that a lot of black people, the Tariq Nasheed types, they want you comfortable as fuck at the bottom. They don't want you to, you know, be, to be upwardly mobile. That's why they always looking to the government to do stuff. I, I went, I went, I went a little bit left there for a moment. Let's get back on track. But this bit stuff been going on for a long time, and it's not, you know, it's not for the best of the black community to to have these conversations in public. But we end up having them in public anyway, because this is the kind of shit that we go through. You know, I remember growing up as a kid. Last, last story where the first time I met a Muslim, he said Christianity was the white man's religion. And I 
I was kind of teetering on the concept of why am I even a Christian in the beginning? Like I was in that point where I was like 19 or 20 and I was just kind of like, yeah, what? Like, yeah, good point. Every time I've ever seen Jesus, he's white. Why should I, why should I believe in white Jesus? You know, I didn't know anything about Muslims. I didn't know what most Muslims look like. I didn't know that the, one of the oldest Christian churches in the world was in, was in Africa. I didn't know that. You know, any of that stuff. I was easily manipulated by the concept that if something is white, it's wrong. And all things white should be rejected, put aside somehow. So that's why, you know, I, I dabbled for like maybe four days in trying to read the Quran. <laughs> and you listen to enough of these Asiatic black men, you're kind of like, wait a minute. Asiatic black man? Asiatic as in Asian? Asians? It, it ain't no... I, I, I didn't know that much about Africa. But I know ain't no Asians in Africa. I can tell you that much. <laughs> you know? And then you realize that they're talking about, you know, the Arabics. You know, the Arabs. And you learn about the Arab slave trade. And then you learn that, you know, Islam is also a slave religion. You know, then you learn that Islam was also forced upon people. And you're kind of like, okay, well, you got to hold everybody to the same standards. So if I can't be a Christian because it was forced on everybody, why the hell would I want to be a Muslim? And that was forced on everybody too. Even at the time as I grew, and I was never going to be like a pure Muslim. That was never going to actually happen. If I was going to end up being a Muslim, it's probably going to be one of those um, uh, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X Muslims. Nation of Islam Muslims or uh, one of those noble Drew Ali uh, <laughs> more science temple Muslims because <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that really spoke to me anyway I was really like I had a friend he recently passed away who was in the five percent nation for a long time so I knew the, I knew the math I knew a lot of stuff but none of it really clicked because it all is attempting to tell you what being black is and there's no way for anybody to have that answer to that question. You can only be you. And hope that other people. Um, buy into it. Alright. So let's finally get into this. Alright. So I spent I spent like a half hour. Which was entirely too long. This video was supposed to be like 30 minutes. But it's not going to be like an hour probably. So here's one of the comments. You technically don't owe anyone an apology. It's really black business. It's always been a thing in community. So anyone from the culture understands what you meant. But we in a different time. So outsiders of the community would not understand what you meant. I don't understand what that means either. <laughs> I really don't. Here's another one. You have nothing to apologize for. Period. Only some know what it's like standing in blackity black, 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 24-7. We don't have the luxury or privilege in standing in anything else. Someone says, in what way is undercutting someone because they aren't black enough? Your stand for your standards supposed to be well intentioned. This isn't a game of telephone, and your message got misconstrued. The message was clear, and that's where the problem lies. It says bogus, just another black person gatekeeping blackness and diminishing someone else because they're not black enough for your standards. Uh, <laughs> this one was pretty funny. To be honest, your career is over, but the apology is cool. <laughs> That seems to be the, the general consensus when you uh, look up the name of Mari Miller. Everybody's like, she's dead. You know, it's over. And I started this video saying that. So that's just kind of how it is. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it's just kind of how it is. Um, the replies just further prove why wrestlers shouldn't interact with fickle marks in the IWC. And that Sasha is right to not stand next to them in photo ops. <laughs> Most toxic fan base of any sport or entertainment. We normals will love you, Mari. Jesus. Amari, I have people in my family that's 50% black. Some 75% black. I'm dark and look, quote, fully black, but my grandpa was half Indian. I'm around 87.5% black. Are we not black enough then? Are you even sure that Ember Moon is fully black? You look more mixed than me. Are you? See, this is the kind of rabbit hole we fall into. This, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is insane stuff, man. 
We all make mistakes and we're constantly growing. I just think that it's important to recognize that biracial people are still black at the end of the day. So Sasha should definitely be included in the discussion. That being said, I love for you to join her and Ember as a future champ. I don't know about that one, dog. I don't know. Um, somebody says, how again was that meant to be <laughs> to mean well? That's a good question. In, in what way does saying this black girl isn't black come off as good intentions? I'm curious. How can you say that in a in a way that isn't completely disrespectful? <clears throat> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Nah, you said what you meant. You don't consider Sasha Banks black or African American, although she is a light skinned black girl. You could have said, I realized what I said was inaccurate and I was wrong. I apologize. Not that excuse you gave, but you're forgiven. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 To anyone, to everyone, how what? was said was well-intentioned. I don't agree with what she said, but I might understand the intent behind it. I don't think the goal was to discredit Sasha, but it was more an attempt to highlight monoracial two black parents, women who look like us. Colorism is so ingrained in our society that light skinned usually biracial black people are often the first in the community to be allowed the access to achieve things. It exhausts at us darker skinned people, women, especially for our representation and trailblazers to constantly be, be, be people who are half white. And sometimes it's just too much. Now, I don't agree that biracials e don't equal black because we've always been one community. Many biracials have lifted us up and been the ones to open doors for all black people. But I get where she's coming from. You see how we let's let's look at this particular part right here. The colorism, which is the only part I didn't mention. The colorism thing. It's, it's so childish. It's ridiculous. The brown paper bag test, <laughs> you know, are you darker than a brown paper bag? It's such a lame excuse too, because and I, I, I think I probably told you guys this before, but the colorism thing to me, I didn't really know what it existed. I didn't really think about it until Michael Eric Dyson. Now, Michael Eric Dyson was the first guy I ever saw from Detroit who, you know, was very intelligent, very smart guy. I remember seeing him on TV back when I was having my political awakening. And I was saying, like, damn, he's from the same city I'm from. You know, he speaks well. He seems very sharp. Wow. Like, this dude's fucking cool. He made, you know, him and his partnership with Cornell West. I went and bought both of their books. And I was reading their books. And then, you know, maybe a year or two, some out later, I saw him on TV. And I saw that he had a brother in prison. And I was like, uh huh. Wow, that sucks. And white guy asked him, well, if race is so important in the United States, why is it that you and your brother born in the same household, got the exact same parents from the same side of town, from the same city? One of you became a professor in a university. The other one went to prison and they was doing this interview and his brother was sitting right there. And Michael A. Dyson looked at him. Let it let he let the, he let it cook for a little while. And then he says, in the history of the black America, there's always been this color thing. And basically he was saying because his skin was lighter than his brother's, he had an easier road. Despite the fact that they grew up in the same house, went to the same schools, had the same opportunities. All of a sudden, the, 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 the color of his skin just being one shade or two shades lighter changed his entire life. It's like, come on. That's when I stopped listening to fucking Michael Eric Dyson. That actually woke me up from a lot of things. Cause I was like, that's such an intensely stupid argument because me and my brothers were three different shades of black. Okay. <laughs> three different shades of fucking black. All right. We all grew up in the same house. I'm six years older than my little brother. No, five years older than my little brother, six years older than my baby brother. All right. If we actually do some, some some studies like you know Thomas Sowell talked about this right and he said that single children children who were born to two parents was raised by two parents their entire life they tend to have better outcomes than children who are born with multiple you know, who are in multiple so if you if, uh, if you're a child of six you know you are less opportunities to go up in the economic strata or to 
increase things, even though this is not entirely true too, because there's, you know, plenty of black people who are, you know, the fifth child of seven or something like that. He turned into a multimillionaire. So it's not entirely true, but he just did the studies and showed that people who were single borns grew up by themselves. They had better outcomes than people who had multiple children. And the longer you have your parents with just the two of you, the better off you are. And I've just, just kind of took that and put it into my own life and said, I was the oldest and I had my parents for five years before my brother came along. And he only had just us two for a few months before my baby brother was born. Now, sure, I come from, we come from a broken household. Sure. But is that five year head start what made me so much smarter than my brothers? Did I make better decisions than they did? And it's like, fucking no. Because we all grew up in the same household. We had the same fucking parents. Now, there may be a little bit of a generational difference. You know, me being born in the mid 80s, them being born in the late 80s and in the early 90s. So we had different we had access to different things. You know, we, we went to different schools. So that might be a little bit different. But ultimately, we just made different decisions. You made different choices. We had different temperaments. We're different people. Different people have different outcomes. It has fuck all to do with our skin color. Fuck all to do with what our parents are. You know? Because, again, we have the same parents. <laughs> so it, none of that has anything to do with it. Now, there are some genetic things that I didn't have that my brothers did get. You know, but those are health related. Those are not in terms of uh, intellectual uh, or studiousness or anything like that. I just like to read. And I read pretty much everything. I read fiction. I read nonfiction. I read comic books. I read magazines. I read pretty much everything. I watch TV with the closed captioning on it. I like to read. Therefore, school was easier for me. You know, I was more in that field. My baby brother, he played football. He liked sports. He was more into sports than I was. He was a better athlete than I am. You know, that has nothing to do with our fucking genetics. We have the same parents. All right. It was just he was more athletically inclined and played football in high school. He didn't make the football team in college and that kind of derailed his life. But that was better for him. Maybe if I was more athletically inclined, maybe if I wasn't born with asthma and got pulled from the PAL football team when I tried to play. And my parents pulled me from the team because they thought my asthma was too bad. And then when I got into high school, it proved to be correct because I ended up having almost an asthma attack during tryouts. So I wasn't athletically inclined. I wasn't going to be able to play football. Despite having the right build and being the right size for it, I was, it wasn't going to work out for me. You know? Now, what am I supposed to say? My skin's darker than my little brother's. That way he got the chance to play high school football. That's stupid. Why would anybody buy that as an intelligent argument? It just makes no fucking sense. That means you have no grasp of the details of what happened. He didn't have the childhood asthma problem that I did. So he, and if he did, he was able to push through it. I wasn't. That shit was crippling for me. I had to carry an inhaler everywhere. Because I had asthma and bronchitis as a kid. That shit fucking sucked. I still could play basketball and football and all that kind of stuff. But it was like, <gasps> every, <laughs> every few minutes, you know. But I tried, goddammit. But it wasn't because of the color of our skin that we had different outcomes. No, we made different decisions with different people. And so when I see the colorism argument, it's always just stupefying to me that people are still making decisions about individuals based off how they fucking look. You cannot tell a person's story about how they look. That makes no sense. It's stupid. It's a complete denial of detail. Let's get back to this thing. You got to be careful when you mention anything that could point towards the boss. There are two former African-American women's NXT champions. Hopefully you become the third. Sasha Banks followers as loyal as Beyonce's beehive and a great career, sis. What? I don't know. I didn't understand that last part. That last part was kind of kind of lost on me. Somebody said you were still right, though. Representation is important and nobody has the right to tell you you're wrong if you don't feel represented. Ooh, 
Oh, my representation. That's becoming a big thing within the last five to 10 years. I didn't hear a lot about that when I was, when I was growing up about representation and all that kind of shit. Not saying it did, wasn't important, but again, I grew up watching good times and the Jeffersons and we had fresh Prince of Bel-Air and almost every other person I saw on TV was like a rich black person. I never felt represented by Oprah Winfrey, you know, or, or anything like that. You know, Joe Dumars or Isaiah Thomas or Michael Jordan didn't represent me. They were basketball players. I was again, I wasn't a basketball player. I didn't even want to be like them. I wanted to be like Barry Sanders, who was a football player. That's why I wanted to play football. But it wasn't because Barry Sanders was black. It's because I'm from Detroit and he's the greatest running back to ever fucking live. And that was it. You know, he was on TV and he was dazzling. He was tremendous. If I wanted to be a wrestler, I wouldn't want to be Shawn Michaels. And he's not, you know, the only black wrestler of any repute when I was growing up was Ahmed Johnson. And I did not like Ahmed Johnson. I wasn't really a fan. I didn't watch WCW because so I know a lot of people going to be like, what about Ron Simmons? I wasn't watching WCW at the time. So I didn't, I didn't know about that. Right. I knew him as Farouk. That's when I was introduced to him as. You know, there was a couple of black people who were in WWF before Ahmed Johnson, but I'm talking about during my most formative years where I was, you know, looking at people on TV and saying, man, I want, I really want to be like him. Michael Jordan wasn't even one of those guys. Cause I didn't really like basketball that much. I watched it because everybody watched it, but I wasn't like a basketball guy. I was a football guy. And so Barry Sanders was kind of like it. And I was a wrestling fan. So I was just kind of like, I don't know, but when it comes to the wrestling thing, <laughs> you only had on there Johnson. So I was like, <laughs> whatever. Um, but let's get through this. Being light skinned and mixed doesn't disqualify your blackness. Shit is mind blowing that this is even a conversation. It's been a conversation for a long time, man. It's been a conversation since before you were even born. So people think that these, these things are settled. This is settled science. It's like, yeah, but the one drop rule is cultural. It's not scientific. And if you want to buy into, if you buy into that racist genetic, then pretty much everybody is black and pretty much everybody is white and pretty much everybody is, uh, some type of Indian in the United States anyway, because there's so much intermixing between those three races that pretty much there's trace amounts of it in everybody. So if you even go by the one drop rule, then you never know. Your grandpa, your grandma might have like an Indian grandparent that they never met. Some people are adopted and they don't even know it. Some people are the child of the neighbor down the street and they don't know it. Like there's all kinds of shit going on. And you know, <laughs> you know, that's like some people are inbred and they don't know it. Your granddaddy had a wife on both sides of town, you know, <laughs> you end up going to school and banging your own sister and you didn't know it. Like that kind of shit, you having sex with your cousins and you didn't know it, or you, maybe you did know it and you don't care, you know, like it, this whole social construction of what people are and what blackness is and all that kind of stuff. It is, it's exhausting. And you could tell from listening to me how much effort I put into it because I grew up thinking about this kind of stuff. This was the central concept of when I became sort of politically aware is you get in the ground floor of the black victimhood narrative. And once you start getting into that black victimhood narrative, you start finding different ways that you're a victim. You know, the straight hairs versus the kinky hairs, the fats and the, and the athletically built, the, the, the people with white parents and the people with no parents, the people who were born in the projects and the people who were born in the hood. And that's a legit one. I believe in that one. I believe because I, I went to the projects twice and I'm telling you, man, the projects are something else. That's different. You know, that's a different style of living, you know, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I may have grew up in a single parent home, you know, in the hood of Detroit on the east side where it wasn't, you know, uh, everybody wasn't very well off, but I wasn't from the projects and the projects breeds a different kind of nigga. I'm telling you that much, but it's not like they're a different black person, you know, like that's a black, different type of black person. Like, no. You know, we're all just black in different ways, but whatever. Uh, it says, you as a black woman should be ashamed of yourself for even making the comment to begin with. You already know how hard it is just being black, but I am damn sure you know how much harder mixed race people within our community have it as well. Notice that we got in this, in, in this conversation, 
that it's easier to be mixed and it is harder to be mixed. <laughs> Just like it's easier to be a woman, it's harder to be a woman. It's easier to be a man, it's harder to be a man. Depending on where you sit in this conversation, you will have these different conversations. Like you can, but this is because people are stupid. You can look at things in a way where there's pros and cons to everything. Every single thing. There's pros and cons to being born in the United States. There's pros and cons to being born in Africa and being born in Jamaica, being born in Japan, being born in Russia, wherever. There's pros and cons to everything. If people are going to be focused on the pros that you have and not focus on the cons, then they're going to say you're privileged based off of blah, 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 not looking at the cons, which is every fucking conversation we end up having about privilege or how much easier some people have it, you know? Being born rich seems easier to somebody like me. I was born fucking poor, but they had different standards. They had different expectations put on them for their lives. They had, you know, something to actually lose. I would go out there and get in trouble. My mom, what's she, what's she going to lose? You know, we didn't own the house that we lived in. Somebody's going to take our house. <laughs> we didn't own that house. <laughs> so, so what? You kick us out of the fucking house. We're all right. You know, but somebody whose parents have something to lose are going to, you know, different expectations. It might have been harder on them. You know, somebody who had two-parent household, it couldn't get away with as much as I did. and probably didn't have the same experience as I did, you know, or the same opportunities that I have. It's that it's silly to me that this is how we decide whether people are perfect victims or not. When instead we should be looking at individuals and sharing individual stories, which seems to be the best way to do it. Because I don't know what made you, you. I don't know. Some people weren't even raised by their parents. They were raised by an auntie or raised by the grandma. You know, some people were not even raised by, you know, um, family members at all. You know, some people were raised by, you know, they're adopted. And there's just no way of knowing what the, what the tried and true success level of people are. We just know that studies point to certain levels of success. That's the only thing we know. But it says nothing about individuals. That's the first thing you fucking learn when you look at anything in economics or anything in science or politics. Whatever the studies say has nothing to do with you as an individual. You know, a hundred people can eat red M&Ms and not get sick. You be the motherfucker to eat a red M&M and die because you were allergic to red dye and nobody knew about it. And that's just kind of how it is. That's how life is. You know? Some people get lupus. Some people don't. Some people have, you know, low blood sugar and have hypoglycemia. Some, you know, or, you know, some people don't. Some people can sit around and eat potatoes and bread and shit and stay skinny and other people can't. You know, you can only, you know, that's why diets don't work too. You know, a lot of these hardcore diets don't really work for everybody. Because it's not individually prepped for you and your body and your genetics and what you need and what you want. Some people have low iron deficiency. Some people don't. Some people are walking around with too much salt in their system and they could be skinny as shit and just have too much salt and sugar in their system. Some people are fat. They don't have enough salt and sugar in their system, you know, and it's just kind of how it is. We have to look at individuals. We can't, you know, make these blanketed comments about what is good or great for somebody in their race or what makes them privileged and all that dumb shit. And none of that stuff works anyway, because there's you always going to run into somebody who disproves it. You know, if you speak in front of a, a crowd of a thousand people, you think that shit applies to everybody? No, it doesn't apply to everybody. It might apply to half the fucking audience. It might only apply to 20% of the audience. It might only apply to two people in the fucking room. You know, so you got to give people individually some space to to say what they say and feel how they feel. So this came kind of silly to me. To, she would even make this comment because it was a, a representation argument. And it's like, how about you become NXT Women's Champion? That way you can say you're representing your parents or something like that, which is the truth. You know, your parents will be very proud of you. Will your race be proud of you? What kind of fucking question is that? There's going to be people who aren't even wrestling fans who are going to say you, you didn't even win that. You were given that because you didn't, <laughs> wrestling's not real, you know? So that sort of mentality is flat to me. It just makes no fucking sense. I hope you apologize to Sasha instead of trying to save face here. Oh boy. 
I bet WWE made her apologize. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, you don't have to apologize, but the business you're in, I understand why you're apologizing. Don't let these weirdos on Twitter bully you. Yeah, weirdos on Twitter. You quick to apologize to the crew, but you never, you never still ain't apologized to Sasha. Child, delete your Twitter again and redo the whole apology. Uh oh. Um, Ryan Simmons is the first black champion, not The Rock. Sorry, not sorry. He's mixed. Naomi, Athena, Jazz, Jacqueline are black. Sasha is mixed. Sorry, not sorry. If you're not black, stay out of our business issues. You won't understand, nor do I care what outsiders outside our race think about this topic. But then let's let's talk about that for a moment, too. I'm, I'm giving a lot of lectures and I had no intention on doing this. Some people don't even consider Ryan Simmons to be the first black world champion because some people say that there was another black world champion. I for, I'm trying to remember. Was it WWA in California? It had a black world champion bear Bear, i think it was bearcat right wasn't it uh editing note it was bearcat right and it was the wwa which um was nwa hollywood wrestling he was the world champion i think in 1963 he won the title and he was recognized as the first black heavyweight champion in professional wrestling that was before ron simmons now some people don't know that some people will say that title is meaningless But that just goes back to this whole victimhood narrative that we have. You can objectively speak that Bearcat Wright did win the world championship or a world championship, a recognized world championship, but even though it was regional. But, you know, the same thing could be said for Pedro Morales. You know, Pedro Morales first. He might not have been the first um, because I think there were probably others. But the first, you know, Hispanic WWF champion, you know, it was sort of a regional title when he won it, but he won it. And, you know, the people at the time didn't care. So I'm pretty sure we shouldn't care now, you know, but that just kind of encapsulates the conversation that we've been having about how some people have gaps in their history. Some people have blind spots in their history. Some people will you know, say that it's not a real title because it wasn't, you know, the NWA championship or the WWF championship or the AWA championship. It was a company that was not under NWA for a short amount of time and then went right back under NWA, which WWE did a couple of times too. So it's one of those things where people will choose their own history. They're choosing their own adventure when it comes to who's the first black world champion in wrestling. It seems silly to me, but you know, this is what we're doing now. Um, so how do you mean? Well, by saying she's not black enough to me. Crazy, because this is a white person saying this, which I shouldn't have said, but it's just the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that picture. (laughs) I shouldn't have said that, though. All right, so let's get into... (laughs) All right. I don't feel like she needed to apologize. Ember Moon is the only fully black NXT Women's Champion. She didn't lie or say anything bad about y'all's boss, but okay. Somebody says, I noticed you didn't apologize to Sasha, and I don't know if you're jealous of her, but you don't know her... You knew she was from German, from Wiki. There's Germans who are African-Americans, but it's clear you wrote that just to throw shade at her, and it's not cute. Hashtag think before you tweet. Um, African-American Germans? Now, look, I know that I think um, Martin Lawrence, his father was in the military, I believe, and he was born in Germany. I I think that was the story of Martin Lawrence. I don't want to Google it and try to find out. I just want to... Sp- Speak from the cuff. Is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about like black people in Germany? Because that wouldn't be African American. It would be Afro German. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it's good to remember that impact are greater than intentions. Well, that's true. How is she being made to apologize for saying a biracial woman is a biracial woman and not a black woman? I'm begging y'all to let the one drop rule go. Some people want to reject the one drop rule. Seems pretty silly to me, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Because if we're going by just how people look, I, I guess, I guess black, I guess Sasha doesn't have black enough features. She don't have thick enough lips. You know, her nose isn't wide enough. I don't know, man. I'm not, I can't tell you what's going on. 
Um, give her credit for finding the nicest way to say, sorry, y'all got mad. Ooh. <laughs> uh, people were mad that you invalidated a woman's blackness and that you still didn't apologize for that. You apologize for us interpreting your words wrong, but how else could they have been interpreted? And when you notice how many people didn't understand what you were saying, um, it's like this is a continuance. You could have just stopped and apologized then. You just kept going and going. So yeah, not a great apology. Somebody said, you doubled down on what you said, so you meant it. Acknowledging that you messed up and apologized for it is the only thing you can do. You've done that here and hope you apologize to Mercedes too. It's a dead issue now. Good luck to you. Keep growing. Um, oh boy. Oh boy, oh boy. I don't believe that you meant well. You tripled down before finally apologizing. And even in your apology, you're sa basically saying, sorry, you were offended. Instead of, sorry, I offended you. It shows very little to no accountability. Well, she is a woman, so. Being mixed and not being accepted by any race was the source of my depression at a very young age. And I've gotten older. I've grown to accept that society doesn't want us. We're merely tolerated in both communities. The old Eddie Kingston argument. Nobody likes me. The, the, the Puerto Ricans didn't think I was Puerto Rican enough. The Irish guys didn't think I was Irish enough. Yeah, yeah. I just get them all with a razor blade. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, she owned up and apologized. She deserves a second chance. A second chance. <laughs> a second chance. Trying to classify another person's blackness is not cool on any level. As black people, we are all fighting the same power dynamics to try to hold us down. Same power dynamics. The same power dynamics. Silver lining. I didn't know who you are, and now I do. Good on you to apologize for whatever you did. I see nothing wrong with you standing, stating your opinion on anything. Doesn't mean I agree or disagree, but you should be allowed and encouraged to say whatever you want without fear. This person has no idea what's going on and is just kind of like chiming in to say, hey, I didn't know who you were before, but now I do. So you successfully got my attention and I have no idea what you really are apologizing for, but you did a good job of it, I guess. And it's like, this is an empty statement. This statement contains <laughs> no, no information, none, none whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what a stupid comment. I mean, I'm glad you apologized, but you lost a fan here. Hope it doesn't affect your career, though. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Lost a fan. All right, let's try to wrap this up in the next 10 to 15 minutes. That Amari Miller tweet was wild. Might be time for me to move on from my hopes of her eventually getting an opportunity to do something in 2.0. When she realized she was going to job to Athena on dark, she came back to Twitter real quick to apologize. <laughs> I don't think she would have cared about that. She probably, I mean, never know. They might be tag team wrestling at some point. Amari Miller literally tweeted the dumbest and racist tweet ever. She doesn't know about Sasha's race and she's upset everyone by talking about her that way. She deserves to leave and never come back. Wow. Never come back. Holy shit. Sasha Bax is half German, half African American. She's black. Amari Miller got some, some nerve trying to dispute her blackness. Oh boy. Amari Miller shouldn't have tweeted it, but she also shouldn't lose her job over it. And the fans on this app, hoping she loses her job, doesn't surprise me either, considering this app is full of toxic fans. Help people be better. Don't drag them down. I don't know, man. I think she put a bullet in her own career at this point. Not going to lie, had no idea who Amari, Amari Miller was until this started happening. If anything, this publicity is helping her because that's how this fucked up world works now, I guess. Amari Miller really tried to invalidate Sasha's blackness because she's mixed, deactivated her account, reactivated her account to say, I'm sorry you took my words that way. We don't fuck with Amari Miller. Triple H, HBK, Stephanie, she needs to get up out of WWE. Jesus, H Christ. Good Lord. Can't believe the audacity with this whole 
fiasco of Amari Miller from NXT running her stupid mouth talking crap about Mercedes Sasha Banks. That she isn't African American. What the fuck? Well, Amari, that's a massive L clown for this BS. She deletes all her tweets and later apologized. Oh, man. Y'all gave that girl Amari Miller a hard time for no reason. Sasha Banks definitely has some prominent Caucasian features. Fuck! Her nose ain't big. Her nose ain't big enough. Her lips ain't thick enough. Good lord. Uh, oh boy. Oh Jesus. <laughs> uh, I'm just now seeing this dumbass tweet from Amari Miller trying to classify Sasha Banks as blackness. What's what's wrong with that sister? S i s t h a. Sister. Amari Miller, I think that's her name, says Sasha wasn't the first African NXT Women's Champion and then doubled down on it when she got called out on it. Oh, boy. That's true. That did happen. And that's a pretty concise way of putting it. If you're going to apologize for something, actually address the issue. But this, it sounded one way to me, but dribble is just lip service. I'm sorry, but that was bullshit. Amari Miller counting on y'all to eat that mess up and get off her back. I guess. I guess. <laughs> I guess so. This is crazy. As president of the wrestling division of the Oreo Coalition, due to Amari Miller's r- remarks and dry ass r- apology, IRT to Sasha Banks, NXT title run, which we recognize her as a black champion, we are snatching Sasha Banks back from the black delegation for the for seven business days. I don't understand that. I don't understand that at all. NXT wrestler Amari Miller is a straight up dumb fuck. Sasha Banks is African American. I don't give a fuck if she's half German. She is still fucking African American. My fellow black folks need to stop this bullshit of this person is or isn't black enough garbage. Yeah, I feel like I've been talking about this for a while now. Oh boy. This seems kind of silly to me. You know, but I'm not surprised at all that, you know, she's got this kind of level of vitriol about Sasha Banks and her blackness. I'm just glad that Sasha Banks didn't say anything about it to really kind of spur any of this crap on. She's kind of been um, doing a decent job of whenever her name comes up in something, she kind of stays away from it, which actually shows a great level of maturity because this is how many times has Sasha Banks been in the middle of some shit? Like when um, she made, uh, what was that? What was that Joker? Sammy Guevara. He made that comment about wanting to rape Sasha Banks and she didn't say anything about it. Nothing publicly, really. Um, and then she basically just acknowledged his apology. And then that was kind of it. She might do the same thing here, which is, I think, with her, you know, she would probably put out a tweet saying, she, you know, saying, hey, everybody, we need to move on from this. You know, me and Amari are good. Yada, yada, yada. And that's it. You know, which is a power move from her perspective because she doesn't need to address it publicly and she knows she doesn't need to, you know, it's very smart um, to do so. Uh, <laughs> Amari Miller hating on and saying she's not black because she's light skinned. I hate black people hating or slandering each other because they're mixed or too light or too dark, but get mad when white people do the same thing. Let's love each other no matter our race or color. Oh my goodness. Oh boy. Jesus H Christ. Good Lord. Good Lord. I really. Oh, here's one. The girls mad at Amari Miller are taking me out. She didn't say anything wrong. Let's keep it 100. If Sasha was Naomi's complexion, she wouldn't have gotten half the accolades they have given her because Naomi wrestled down in an era where women's wrestling wasn't even a focal. Oh my goodness. She got nothing. These girls love to pretend colorism isn't a thing. Nothing is wrong with Amari giving the only dark-skinned NXT Women's Champion her props. Y'all are corny for even trying to spin this extra-ass narrative. All right. Explain Jacqueline and Jazz. Oh, you said that Sasha Banks wouldn't have won anything if she were dark-skinned. Okay, is she darker than Jazz? No. Is she darker than Jacqueline? No. Didn't WWE put the Cruiserweight title on Jacqueline? A men's title? And Jacqueline not only... <laughs> what am I doing? What am I, why am I falling into this stuff? I'm trying to be above the fray. 
I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to be above the fray. And I ended up falling into this hole of uh, arguing with these morons about this shit. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. It's, it seems uh, this is embarrassing. Yeah, she was a cruiserweight champion. Yeah, yeah. So she won a men's title. So they care. They really like Jackie. They really respect her. She won a men's title. Um, I guess Amari Miller will say Sasha Banks and Bianca weren't the first two black women to main event WrestleMania because Sasha was too light to be black, according to Amari Miller's thought process. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Amari Miller discrediting Sasha Banks' blackness as a black woman because she's also German. Yeah, that's disrespectful. Sasha Banks is one of the greatest NXT women's champions of all time and one of the greatest women's wrestlers in history. The disrespect is real. Mm. Uh, the timing is simply coincidental. She found an Instagram post about Sasha's fetish the same day Amari Miller decided to be a weirdo. Wait a minute. What's this about a fetish? Hold up now. Hold up now. Sasha Banks. Wait a minute. So let me get this straight. Sasha Banks' blackness was invalidated today. And somebody brought up Sasha's love for Asian people and culture as a rebuttal. And this was done by a person with a history of pitting black women against and Asian women against each other. What the fuck? Oh, God, let me get out of this hole. Please, somebody throw me a rope. I gotta get out of this fucking hole. This is ridiculous. All right. Amari Miller said that Sasha Banks doesn't count as a black NXT women's champion because she's half German. And Kiana James, who is a quarter black, out here saying nigga and joking about her mom need to go back to Africa. Wait a minute, Kiana James has a black parent? I didn't know that. See, that's... I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I thought she just had a really good tan. You know? <laughs> I thought she just had a good tan. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't know that, and I, I don't care. I don't know, man. This is... What did I do? What did I do? I don't know. I don't know what I did. Ended up falling into this. I don't know what I did. Oh, boy. I understand why some of these misfit fans disrespected Mercedes Renato. But when your own co-workers bluntly disrespecting her online, it's just crazy. Amari Miller, you need to worry about getting better before publicly disrespecting someone who had the greatest women's match. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. I forgot that Amari Miller was out hurt, by the way. She got like a severe concussion. And that's why she's not been on TV. She wasn't on TV much anyway. Um, even though she was healthy for most of that time, uh, just got off work and seen the Amari Miller comments. To be honest, y'all have been doing this for years and it needs to stop. Sasha Banks is the first African American women's champion. She's a black woman because black women come in all shapes and are mixed. Like the fuck is she talking about? Uh, red as written, by the way. Um, Amari Miller, well, girl, if this not black, something is wrong with your MC. You need some help. Stop trying to make problems between black women's wrestlers. That's not nice at all. I guess they're talking about Sasha Banks taking on the, uh, cultural artifacts of, um, being black, like the four fingered rings and all that, the hip hop stuff, which I don't look. I'm not going to go into that. You know, I'm not going to go into that, but she's black. All right. Let's, let's not go too far with it. The rock is black. All right. I feel like I need to say it. So people will not, will, will stop it with the bullshit. I was rooting for Amari Miller before Amari was even rooting for herself. And this is how she acts. It's bad for her. And on top of that, she ain't apologized nor take it back. She said she was aware what she said. We, who? Alicia would never. They tell Pineapple Alicia Fox, you need to get the fuck out of here with that. Beat it with the Alicia Fox stuff. Amari Miller don't deserve her career destroyed over this. She was she had every right to state her opinion as a black woman and not saying I think Sasha isn't black, but is a black woman fighting other black women representation something worth slating and canceling each other women for now? What? Oh, I don't understand. I don't understand how many, why are people so illiterate on Twitter? I don't, I don't go. Huh. That's what you better do. Amari Miller, delete that Twitter account. You threw, you threw, you was gone. 
get on here and shade Sasha Banks and we were supposed to go in to say psych? What? These people are so fired up. And uh, Oh, God. What the fuck? I'm lost. As someone who has half white themselves, what Amari Miller said is wrong. Okay. Thank you um, for your mixed perspective on this. <laughs> Thank you for the mixed perspective on this. Um, Amari really was in the wrong here. Mixed or, or whatnot, Sasha is black, and the fact that she is and was the first African American NXT Women's Champion, it's not fair to discredit her accomplishment. All right, so let's wrap this up. I want to wrap this up with some with a little bit more speculation because the it gets a little deeper than this. How is Sasha Banks African American? She's not from Africa. See, see how crazy this gets. I used to have this conversation with people all the time. You know, Jesse Jackson is the one who pushed for that whole Afro African American crap. Most black people from the United States are not. Or they are maybe tangentially from Africa due to, you know, um, ancestors way, way back. But then again, a lot of people don't know where their ancestors come from. You know, I guess if you go back far enough, everybody is African. You know, I, I, I typically like the word black personally, because I think black is all encompassing. It takes into account the Jamaicans and the Trinidadians and the Canadians and all that kind of stuff. We don't have to go into the whole you know, we can break it down further and further as we go along. Ain't nothing wrong with that. There are real African-Americans, people who are, you know, Kofi Kingston is an African-American. He was born in Africa. Now he's an American citizen. So I think just for the, the sake of specificity, we should not be using the term African-American to include people who were born in the United States. You know, it's, that's just me. You're an American citizen. To, to quote Ronald Reagan, and I probably shouldn't do this because it's going to rub people the wrong way. But being an American, you can come from anywhere. You can come from Africa or Asia. You could be an Arab. You could be Canadian. You could be Mexican. Pretty much anybody can be an American. You know, all you have because an American is not blood and soil. We might be one of the only countries that thrives off of things like immigration. Which is weird how we have such crazy debates about immigration nowadays. But literally, that's what America is. It's an, it was created by Englishmen who didn't want anything to do in England anymore. So, you know, they, they moved here. They didn't want anything to do in England anymore. And they rebelled against England. That's why it was a revolution. And not they colonized the place and then it just became a whole different place. They came under the British flag and then they rebelled. And created their own flag. And over the years, Jews and the Irish and more Africans and people from the islands and the Spanish and, the, the, you know, all those other people have the Japanese, the Chinese. They have come here and become Americans. So Ronald Reagan may not have been right about a lot of things, but he was right about that. You know, the very founding of the United States is a nation of immigrants, a nation of people who come together under a concept of ideas, not about blood and soil, which I know a lot of people in the con in the conservative party tend to believe that, you know, Americanism is a blood and soil thing. That's the foundational black Americans thing. Like that's not entirely true. Some, there are some people, man, I'm telling you, I have met some Muslims and some Jews and some Africans who are more American than most people. And what I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking like, Hot dogs on 4th of July, fireworks, Americans. I'm talking, they know the documents. They've read the history. You know, they have lived somewhere else and knows the difference between where they come from and the United States. And that's what it means to really be an American. You know, that sometimes people who are born here don't really appreciate it as much as we should. You know, and that's kind of how we, when we started getting a lot of these black socialists and you know, the Black Lives Matter types and and the Britney Griners who was, you know, oh, America is so racist and everything. And then you end up stuck in a, you know, in a Russian prison and wishing that you were in the United States, you know.
sad to say, but that's kind of how it is sometimes. But I've talked about this long enough. This video is four times as long as I thought it was going to be. But I felt like I needed to really fully, you know, uh, look into this subject and talk about it. Um, thank you guys for your time. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, peace out. Uh -huh.